front of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Taib, and he, they would read it back to him. If there was anything, he would correct it. Then they moved to Medina. In Medina, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam ordered different sahabas to write different. And some of what Ali, for example, is one of the scribes, I think it was Zayd ibn Thabith, Ubay ibn Ka'b, and some of the other companions were writing for Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Now, when Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam died, and before his death, the Qur'an was not gathered into one book. Book, I'm talking about book. By the way, the Qur'an was not finished. It was not gathered into an actual book. It was written on different parts and memorized with the people, with the Sahabas. How, if you look throughout the 23 years that the Quran was revealed, each year Ramadan, Jibreel would come and review with the Ard, review with Prophet Muhammad and make sure everything is okay. And many times Zayd was there, especially in the last revision, which happened two times in Ramadan, Zayd ibn Thabit was there revising the scripts and make sure that everything is okay. So again, we have written down, we have revisions of the written down, and we have memorization, which is checked by Prophet Muhammad which is checked by Jibreel from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is very strong. Are you with me so far? Next thing though, Prophet Muhammad passed away. And the Quran was not yet being kept in one book. Someone might ask, why not? Because the last revelation came only a few days after or before Prophet Muhammad died. The Quran was still being revealed. So when this happened, and you see the wisdom behind this, as we'll go through the compilation that was led by Abu Bakr and later on by Uthman. May Allah be pleased with them. You see, if we look at the history of scriptures, we find that when scriptures were compiled, and we have the example of the Bible, for example, that were done before closed doors. There were certain councils where only certain VIP priests, cardinals, and so on, or high priests, whatever the denominations they had at that point, they were allowed to participate. Your just normal Joshmo was not allowed to have a say in what is scripture and what is not, or to even know what's going on. They were not allowed. And we look for the different councils, for example, a lot of the scriptures were burnt. People would go inside, they would take different votes on what is supposed to be scripture and what is not, saying that the Spirit is inspiring them, the Holy Spirit. This is scripture, this is not, this agrees, this doesn't, and let's burn the rest. But a lot of people say this, but they don't look at the historical background as what was influencing their decisions, for example. And for example, at that time there was a big fitna or a big problem between what's called Pauline Christianity or Trinitarian Christianity and the Aryan, the Aryan, they would call it deviation. And Arius and some other people, but specifically he was the strongest opponent of Jesus being God, okay, or the Son of God. So anyhow, this has been by the political parties or the strength at that point was pretty much cut down, ab abolished, and a lot of people were ex extradited, some killed, and so on and so forth. But we look at the Quran, so your general people had nothing to do. People in that town had nothing to do. They didn't know what's going on. What's the scripture? Actually, they didn't even read the Bible. They're not even allowed to read the Bible. Actually, in history of Christianity, you could be killed if you had in possession your Bible. We know what happened with the translation of the Bible. We know very well what happened with some of the translation, that they ended up being burnt and killed. So this is no secret. But we need to keep this in mind because a lot of times people come and say, well, you guys have done the same thing. Well, you guys have a history of the Quran. So let's keep going with this history of the Quran and to see if what the people are saying is truth. So Abu Bakr 
Omar comes to him and he says that in the battle of Yamama, death has dealt most severely with the Quran. People were memorizing the Quran. A lot of them were killed. Some of them. And I fear, I fear that because of these wars, that we should collect the Quran. We don't want it to, you know, these, these people have memorized the Quran, they're dying. We need to collect the Quran in a book. We know we're going to die. We memorize the Quran. But we need to have this educational th system going on. Memorization, written. Memorization, written. You understand? So, he said to Abu Bakr, let's collect the Quran. Let's put the Quran in one book. Abu Bakr said, how can I do something like that? He said, I could not do something. How can I embark on what the Prophet said never did? So Omar radiallahu anh, he kept uh, in, insisting and insisting and insisting. Let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. And then finally, Abu Bakr says, Allah opened my heart to it, and they started doing it. And they put in charge Zayd ibn Thabith, who was the scribe, the original scribe of Prophet Muhammad who was present there at the last revision and the revisions by Angel Gabriel Jibreel alayhi salatu salam. So he says something interesting. That he says that by Allah, had they asked me to move a mountain, it could have not been weighier than what they requested me to do now. Why? Because he feels the bearing of the responsibility. This is such a big thing. He knows that this is such a huge task ahead of him. Yes, people have memorized it. But you see, they've done something that will actually remove any kind of confusion or doubt for the rest of humanity. And that is that everyone contributed to this task. Everyone knew what was happening. Actually, the Quran was living with the people. The, and the people were living with the Quran. Their whole day, their night, how they woke up, how they went to sleep, how they ate was Quran. So it was only natural that this task was very monumental now. They have to make sure that there's no doubt in the minds of people that this is the correct thing. So basically, we look that Zaid was a point task and he started collecting the Quran. We need to understand that they knew the Quran. So someone will say, why don't you just take a pen and wrote it in a book? But anyone could have accused him that he made it up or that he wrote it from himself. Do you understand? No, he didn't do that. He made sure that every single person, they actually stood, put Bilal in front of the masjid and they started calling to the streets. Anyone who knows the Quran, who has written parts of the Quran, everything, bring it with two witnesses as the Quran tells us, SubhanAllah, this is the principle of the Quran, to establish that you have heard it and seen it and received it from Prophet Muhammad SAW himself. Now this is a hard thing. And we find that people have started coming, bringing parches, different bones, leaves and so on where the Quran has been written. People have memorized the Quran, the Quran are coming, Ahlul Sufa who are in Medina, in the Masjid of the Prophet SAW, doing only memorization of the Quran. Many of them, memorizing, memorizing, memorizing. But this was not enough. They were not just going to go based on memory. Because from day one, Prophet Muhammad SAW, yes, he, was, he memorized, but he also wrote it down. He called the scribes. So they followed the same principle. Written, memorized. Written, memorized. طيب. So, what happened is that they basically brought the copies of the Quran and they started compiling. They started bringing using the oral sources. And look what Zayd says. He says, So I gathered the Quran from varying parch parchments and pieces of bone and from the chest of men, their memories. So it shows here that people memorize, people written it down, both are bringing together. And he says something interesting. He says, I found the last two verses of Surah Al Bara with Abu Khuzayma al-Ansari. That last two verses. So, these are the last two. He's compiled the whole Quran. There's only two verses missing. 
Now, this is important. Why? Because it shows us that he knows which verses are, which they are. How would he know that it's the last two verses? He knows from the memory. They all know. But written, it was not found except with one companion that he has written down. And his name was Khuzayma al-Ansari. And these were the last two verses of Surah Al-Bara. Now, SubhanAllah, it's amazing again, because for example, Zayed could have just said, well, you know, there's two verses missing. I know which one they are. I'll just rip, write them down. You guys are all here, right? We all memorize the Quran. Let's just write it down. No. Even that small two verses, they didn't break the procedure, which was memorized, written down. Memorized, written down. So he found it with Abu Khuzayma al-Ansari. And so the Quran was completed. Now we find that once completed, the Quran was placed in the state archives under the custodianship of Abu Bakr. And it was called the suhuf, or the plural, literally meaning sheets of apartments. So it was written down. Later on, after the passing of Abu Bakr, after the passing of Abu Bakr, he died, of course, after a very short time, after appointing, taking appointment into the leadership of the Khalifa, he passed away. Omar came in as the leader. Later on, he was assassinated by Abu Lula Majuzi while praying Fajr. And after him, the person who stepped up to the leadership role of Khalifa was Uthman radiallahu And this is where the actual proliferation of the Qur'an starts. And that's why the Qur'ans that we have on the shelves are called the Uthman al-Mus'haf. What happened during the time of Uthman? Hudayf ibn Yaman went to Uthman directly from Azerbaijan. Islam was spreading. Islam was spreading in the Armenian frontier, very close to my country. <laughs> and the Muslims were coming into Islam into these countries, and they were not Arabs. They were learning the Quran. Some of you are learning the Quran as it is right now. Some of you are making mistakes. I'm making mistakes. And it changes the meaning of the Quran. Okay? For example, إِهْدِينَ صِرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيرِ صِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِ Right? Some people say صِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ Okay, زِينَ and ذِينَ is a big difference. Huge difference. You're talking about zina or zina, which is adornment. Or some people say zina, which is zina. And it makes a big difference. صِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ Those who. And some say أَنَمْتَ but it's not correct. It's an'amta. There's an ayn there. If you say an'amta, you say those of you who have put to sleep. You have put them to sleep. An'amta, okay, who you have any favor. You put na'ma. So, people were making mistakes. They were learning the Quran. People were saying, oh, our recitation is good. Ours is not. So on and so forth. So, Hudayfa came to Uthman and says, Ya Khalifa Muslimin. Take this home on my hand before they differ about the book like the children, like the Christians and the Jews. He was scared that these people are starting reciting things they're not pronouncing properly and we're going to end up the same way. So Omar and Uthman started a committee. In, in it included was again Zayd ibn Thabit who was active in the first gathering of the Qur'an. And what was the purpose of the committee? Was to make copies of the Qur'an and to spread them to the different areas of the world so that people can learn them properly. So that people can learn them properly. So they don't make mistakes. They don't change the meaning. As such, Uthman, he prepared the Mus'haf 
from the Suhuf, the book that came from